Okay, well, it's um, my pleasure to um, preside now over the presentations of the awards. Um, we are going to be presenting two awards today. The first is the Carolyn Shaw Bell Award, and the second is the Elaine Bennett Research Prize. Um, and in both cases, um, I will not actually present the uh, introduce the um, we have others to do that um, let me just say a couple of words about the Carolyn Shaw Bell Award and um, I note that I see several former Carolyn Shaw Bell Award winners here uh, in the audience so thank you um, so Carolyn Shaw Bell was the founding chair of CSWEP she was also an economics professor at Wellesley College uh, and a leader in the field and a leader in um, mentoring and encouraging women in bo at both the undergraduate, graduate, and faculty levels. Um, the CSWEP established a prize uh, in her honor and uh, we have been awarding this prize every year, I believe since 1998. This year, uh, the recipient of the prize is Rohini Pandey and Natalia Regal is going to present. So um, first I wanna say I am so honored to be introducing Rohini. I have been lucky enough to benefit from Rohini's mentorship at every stage of my academic career. I have known Rohini first as her undergraduate research assistant then her pre-doctoral fellow, graduate advisee, and now as her co-author, her colleague, and her friend. Other than my parents, there's nobody who deserves more credit and more thanks for where I am today than Rohini Pandey. Without her, I would have left this profession many years ago. As a poor, queer, Latina immigrant, I already felt out of place as a Harvard undergraduate, but especially so in the economics department. I think sensing my passion for the work, but also my vulnerability, Rohini decided to take me under her wing. Over the last 12 years since then, her generosity, her active encouragement, and the example that she herself sets have pushed me forward, showing me that I do belong, that people like me can make positive contributions both to the profession and to policy. It's really hard for me to describe just how much Rohini cares. Maybe this best comes through in the way that with some kind of magical foresight, Rohini always seems to know where I might get tripped up and preemptively reaches out. For example, when I was a graduate student, as many of us are, I was deeply uncomfortable talking to professors. Sensing this, Rohini often invited me over to dinner parties with her colleagues so that I could meet and talk to people about my work in a friendly environment. Unfortunately for Rohini, this foresight also extends to wishes in my personal life. I still remember how, when I got bit by a dog in India, Rohini privately contacted our research team and my best friend to force me to go get the rabies vaccines in the hospital <laughs> because Rohini knows that I'm not very good at taking care of my health. Or how, when I broke my leg when I was her research fellow, Rohini would come to visit me at the hospital with food and novels to entertain myself. Rohini's care is also obvious in the way that she has, on so many occasions, directly intervened on my behalf. Just before my fourth year of graduate school, the partner organization of my job market pro project uh, suddenly decided to pull out. I was devastated. When I told Rohini, she immediately responded and said that she was going to use her personal research funds to buy out my semester so I could be in India and find a way to make the project work. It wasn't a question, she just told me that she was doing this, because this is just how Rohini is. Rohini also pushes me to stand up for myself. I remember clearly how in my second year of graduate school, Rohini took me to meet with the Chief Minister of Rural Development in all of India. She does this all the time with her students and research assistants so that we can get practice pitching projects to senior officials. Like so many women, I am often reluctant to take ownership of my own work. So in the meeting, when describing a project for which Rohini and I are co-principal investigators, I called the work Rohini's study. Afterwards, she gave me one of her looks. She told me, never again will you credit our joint work to me. I can spend literally hours telling you anecdotes like this. So naturally, I used to flatter myself thinking that Rohini must really like me, uh, because obviously, <laughs> she doesn't have time to devote so much effort to all of her students. 
But over the years, and especially in reading the over 20 beautiful letters in support of Rohini's nomination for this award, I see how wrong I was. RAs, employees, students, junior and senior faculty write about Rohini's incredible generosity and how her seemingly constant awareness of challenges that they might face have helped them succeed. One of Rohini's letter writers, now a tenured faculty member, wrote, as a junior, it would have been easy for me to get lost, to not know people or to be known, to not get credit for my ideas or my work. But Rohini never let me be complacent or afraid. This letter writer goes on to describe how it was Rohini who sent her conference invites, nudging her to apply. And it was Rohini who showed up and gave her the encouragement to keep fighting after, at a crucial stage in this woman's career, she had been torpedoed with the vitriolic review. On top of her mentorship, and of course, aside from her very prolific research, Rohini finds the time to be a leader and a devoted campaigner for women in economics more broadly. She fights the big battles, the ones that directly involve institutional change. One of her colleagues at the Kennedy School writes, Rohini is always the guaranteed voice in the room who will raise questions of gender whenever there's a potential for bias, whether it is how we select and advise graduate students, run junior and senior searches, mentor junior colleagues, vote on promotion or on tenure decisions, Rohini is there to ensure that the concerns of women academic, that women academics have and the barriers that they face are given serious attention. But for Rohini, fighting these bigger battles is just not enough. She also dedicates herself to fighting the everyday small battles, the ones that take up time and seem insignificant enough that we often tell ourselves that it's okay to avoid the uncomfortable conversation and instead look the other way. For instance, last fall, Rohini took the time to go through each field seminar schedule at Harvard. She took note of each field that had not a single invited female seminar speaker for the semester and personally reached out to the, department to the field heads as well as to the department. And it worked. Similarly, she has successfully pushed for more female chairs of conferences and female journal editors. As one of her letter writer notes, in typical Rohini behavior, Rohini has even threatened to boycott conferences if the representation of women in them did not increase. Through her example, Rohini makes us all more brave. In their letters for her nomination, almost every writer describes some way in which because of knowing Rohini, they had stood up. Here are just a few examples. A current second year PhD student wrote that Rohini's drive inspired her to voice her discomfort with the imposing stairwell of all white male former department heads that greet you when you enter the Harvard Economics Department. <laughs> it turns out she wasn't the only one feeling that way. This student's initiative led to a petition and now to a redecoration of that stairwell. Another student tells of how she challenged a professor when, in a lecture about discrimination, he kept referring to papers in which a woman was the first author, instead by the names of her male co-authors. A tenured faculty member wrote, because of Rubini, I was moved to speak up when the marital status of a potential female hire was brought up as a negative collocation issue. I hadn't managed in the past to speak up with the force of my conviction that we should not consider spousal reasons more of a handicap for a female than a male candidate. Rohini has dedicated her life in her research and otherwise to the cause of women. I hope that we can all follow her example and keep fighting the big and the small battles. Thank you. It's a true honor to receive this award. Thank you, Natalia. And thanks to everyone who wrote letters. I'm also incredibly honored to be following in the footsteps of so many amazing women who won this award before me. 
For my own career progression, I have many to thank, my family, those who mentored me, co-authored with me, and the many students I've learned from. Thank you, I think many of you know who you are. I'm grateful for the professional support I have received. <coughs> but at the same time, I'm also acutely aware that as a profession, we're currently failing many young women. Just 10 days ago, over 300 graduate students and research fellows across US economics departments put out an open letter to our profession requesting institutional changes that I quote, address the power imbalances that drive out talented individuals, prevent the inclusion of underrepresented groups, and collectively damage our discipline, uh, unquote. Young women are falling off or are being pushed off the ladder in our profession. As we just saw, the share of women in the US uh, in economics has stagnated for several decades. And recent work suggests that the share of junior assistant professors is actually declining. Um, Lundberg and Stearns report that the share of female assistant professors fell from 29 to 24% between 2009 and 2017. While levels of female faculty representation in economics are comparable to those in the hard sciences, the trend in economics remains among the worst. We should care about this, not only out of a sense of justice, but out of concern for our profession. When women fall off the ladder, we lose some of our most talented economists. A lack of diversity limits the range of questions we ask and the kind of answers we are able to give, which impoverishes not only us as a discipline, but also those in governments, companies, and NGOs who count on our insights. So a recurring theme in my talk today is going to say that in a world with bias, simply acting on what we believe are our convictions may not be enough. And so to drive this home, let me start with my own personal experience. I grew up in India, and like with many born into privilege, it took me a long time to realize what privilege meant. As I began my second year in undergraduate economics, the Indian government sought to introduce quotas for lower castes. Student protests broke out across our campuses, and I remember how I and my colleagues engaged in many earnest discussions about how economics had taught us that it was about merit and ability and people don't need an extra, extra help. We largely ignore that with pretty much without exception, all of us engaged in these conversations belong to these elite castes. In 1992, job quotas were implemented and I left India for Oxford. And suddenly I went from being a member of the Indian elite to being an outsider in a system where privilege worked in a slightly different way. And I think seeing this jarred my thinking. Now I was in a place where you could tell a person's social stature, not by their name, but by the way they talked. And I began to realize that what we often adopt as, or what we think of as fair systems are often not those. They often end up putting some sets of people, typically those who are excluded by a prevalent norm regarding who deserves at disadvantage. I learned that in a theoretically race-blind, caste-blind, or gender-blind system that thinks it's rewarding merit, you may not do so when the playing field is uneven to start with. And, and that historical discrimination and inequality can imbalance present power structures such that for some groups, all playing fields are always uneven. Over the years, through my research and by being in this profession, I also learned the power of norms. I think socialization of norms means that for all of us, it can become second nature that men and women who behave similarly are judged differently. A man is ambitious, while many of us have often been described as women with sharp elbows. A man's research reflects his brilliance, while a woman's research reflects her hard work. Assertiveness, drive, competitiveness, these are considered as masculine traits, just as modesty, cooperation, and caregiving are female traits. And so in our profession, women often end up facing the catch-22 of being subject to harsh commentary on their abilities when they show exactly the same traits that are used to identify the potential for success. I've been lucky to have colleagues who have called me out when I've been blinded by bias norms. I've also been lucky to have many friends who have led by example. And as you've seen, I've learned from an amazing set of students. But I, like others, have also on occasion been careless. I've not always noticed the quiet, thoughtful woman in my classroom, and I've often jumped in far too fast with a question in the seminar. I've been guilty of lazily assuming that a six foot three tall male PhD student would be a thick skinned and confident researcher when exactly the opposite was true. And unfortunately, these careless judgments can add up in terms of who feels supported and confident to pursue the research they love. And as the open letter from our graduate students reminds us, Systemic change requires institutions that will move us closer to an equal playing field. The power of norms is such that it can make certain behaviors second nature. And so I think what lies ahead for us is to try to identify how we can shape our norms and institutions to limit, limit this kind of careless injustice that happens far too often. How do we do this? 
I don't have a lot of answers, but here are some things that I think I have learned and I think we have learned as a profession. First, let me start with what I think we value and why in our profession. Abstract thinking and hierarchical categorization permeates our profession. Alongside, we hold dear the idea that our profession is a meritocracy, a free market for talent. Yet we often find talent by placing some researchers in a star category based on simple but poorly justified concepts of quality of mind. In doing so, we often fail to recognize bias and how it perpetuates. We run the danger of making invisible on all those work that a star's work depends. We reward the individual for teamwork such that our professional rankings end up reflecting an inaccurate model of how actually our profession works. We have in the end, I think right now, devalued collaboration among both graduate students and junior faculty. The cost of such simplistic categorization can be high. We lose talented individuals who believe that the models don't speak to the issues of social justice they care about. We lose brilliant collaborative researchers who are not identified as stars. And we lose researchers who bring a new valid voice in the profession. And as a result, we often fail to provide the more nuanced policy advice that can support a democracy where not all values are shared and where growth isn't the tide that raises all boats. Implicit bias and oversimplified categorization doesn't just exist in individual judgments. They're also built into our institutional systems. For the case of women, I believe institutional change requires us to understand a fact we just saw, why is economics a leaky pipeline? Let me talk a little bit about what I think we've learned about four points. The first stage is undergraduate economics. I think we heard a lot about the statistics on this. One thing I wanted to highlight is that there has been a lot of recent initiatives. So for instance, department-specific experiments, part of the initiative led by Claudia Golden, has led a lot of promising results which are going to be easy to implement. We should all be pushing our departments to be informing high-performing students about the relative performance and exposing students to successful female graduates. These are easy things to do. Relatedly, we need to acknowledge diversity of perspectives, values, and norms early on. Several departments are reformulating the introductory economics courses to make explicit the moral values. We could do much more to be advertising these efforts. More broadly, it's important that we recognize that in the end, individuals can't do everything to correct biases for, the what, for what female graduates face during their BA. We need to institutionalize ways to ensure that departments encourage female undergraduates. My colleague Dan Levy, for instance, has developed a software that tracks students' comments in classes, alerts uh, instructors of uneven participation, and prompts them to include students more equally. I've certainly benefited from using this in my classroom. But more critically, I see Golden's undergraduate in innovations as telling us all that we can and should be experimenting and learning from pilot projects. Just after Christmas, and I thank my many friends who responded, I polled some of my colleagues for ideas. And what I was struck by was how much is being done as individual initiatives and how little I knew about them. I would urge AE and CSWEP to think of ways of just making sure that people know what other people are trying. So the second stage is entry into graduate school. Again, as we heard, the percent of female students undergraduate and graduate economics programs has remained roughly constant at 30%. And this has led some to suggest that the problem on average isn't at the transition from undergraduate to graduate, but is actually at the stage after that into the first job. But I think the two facts that suggest otherwise. First, as we saw, there's huge variation in the proportion of female students. Second, a very large fraction of our graduate students are not students who've completed the undergraduate in the US. Here are some statistics. So Bustan and Lange report that between 1994 and 2017, 47% of PhDs in economics in US schools were non-US citizens. I looked at six top economics departments for the job market candidates this year. 52% had non-US undergraduate degrees. Within this pool of job market candidates, the gender imbalance is significantly worse in the non-US undergraduate pool. So 36% of job market candidates in the non-US undergraduate group were women compared to 52% in the US undergraduate group. And so in fact, there are two pipelines that are feeding into the graduate school and mid-pool. We just don't know how they interact, and so we know little about whether there is a problem and where. That said, I think we can again start learning from individual department experiences. At Stanford, female admission rates were relatively low a few years ago. Uh, Muriel Niederli, Pascaline Dupa, and other faculty identified narrowness of screening criteria, and they sought to instead implement broader criteria, which in the short run has meant that they spend a lot of time reading individual files. At this point, however, it has yielded returns for Stanford in a pretty in 
person intensive way, we've seen a significant rise in female admission rates. A second concern that I think is echoed in the job market as well is herding across departments. A small set of women get many offers. Um, this outcome is consistent with the use of narrow criteria that's, that screen on characteristics that are more common in the male applicant than the female applicant pool. So what can we do? I think we should start thinking about blinding some parts of the process. We have a lot of evidence that blinding ha has results in other places. Things like personal evaluation statements, others could be blinded when they're being reviewed by graduate admission committees. I think as job advertisers, letter writers, and reviewers, we should institutionalize ways of knowing how gendered the use of language is. We all complain about it at job market season time. Individuals can do it now on their websites, but I think departments could just pass all letters through such mechanisms. You know, departments and centralized processes such as Interfolio could easily use such websites to gender check. At my, uni at my department in HKS, now all jo job advertisements before they go on to um, any public forum are gender checked. Third, given that exposure to female economists influences young women's interest in choosing economics, I think there are high returns to increasing the representation of women in international fora, such as international econometric society meetings. We can do much better here than if you go to the current econometrics website and see what the numbers are. Uh, I think departments should track much more admission decisions and learn what criteria are good predictors. Because absent some better understanding of the model that predicts success, we're going to continue admitting too few women. So the third stage is female economists on average have a worse placement record for their first job. Here a common concern that I heard when I polled uh, female economists is aggressive behavior in seminars, that this shuts women down and that this can be particularly paralyzing in high stake settings such as job talks. We also by now have robust evidence of professional bias in how refereeing works and in how much credit women get for co-authored work. So what can be done here? I think we can have simple norm setting in seminars. Um, a number of departments have started doing it. This can be done much more broadly. We should investigate the returns to job screening processes that are less reliant on individual perceptions of quality and routinize the process. Small biases in how department faculty judge student work can get amplified if the placement process uses this judgment to decide discrete differences in which students get recommended to which departments. We could experiment with basing department interview lists on reviews of job markets that do not rely on placement officers telling us whom to look at. We could also ensure that identical questions in the same order are asked of all candidates and one faculty member keeps track at the rates at which male and female candidates are interrupted during interviews. Decades of research in decision science tells us that structured interviews do a much better job predicting per in future performance than unstructured conversations. We can use written forms for faculty reviews of candidates with multiple criteria. What we definitely need to do is to move away from gestalt evaluations such as I like him better than his job market paper or strong on unobservables. Or conversely, her paper is not economics. Uh, the, I think we've all heard these claims far too often. And finally, improving hiring practices to include women is not the same as interviewing the three female candidates that all top schools are interviewing. Departments should set similar candidates far too often we focus on ungettable women and gettable men. Departments should track the outside offers received by women and men who they interview, fly out, and give offers to. The last stage is relative to men, women publish less in the first seven years of their career. And here it's clear that departments can and should do more to reduce the career costs of having children. We now have evidence that equalizing maternity and paternity leave in economics departments disadvantages women. But I'm not sure we are acting on this evidence. And perhaps departments can also consider making allowances for pre-birth pregnancy costs, which I think many women report as being quite costly for them. We can aim to have greater diversity in our department speakers, which is, I think many of us forget um, almost the fortune we have when we are in charge of a seminar and can choose whom to invite. It's a wholly discretionary activity. Routinization of feedback procedures, whether by mentors or committees, should be undertaken. I think having, having a mentor isn't enough. I know firsthand that as a mentor, I've made mistakes. And as a mentee early on, I received advice that I know was incorrect. One important lesson that I learned is that for those of us who act as mentors, advisors, or supervisors, it's important to recognize that brilliance in research isn't necessarily correlated with thickness of skin. Negative experiences that some individuals can put behind them or even find positive in overcoming can prove devastating for others. Some individuals thrive on adversity, while others just don't. A research career does not need to be a trial by fire. 
In a profession where women are a minority, female economists are both more likely to be at the receiving end of romantic interest, desired or undesired, from often senior male economists and to partner with them. The power dynamics that can ensue when women reject advances or when relationships can relationships end can play out in the profession for years in ways that neither party might expect. These experiences can certainly cause some to leave the profession. This is a problem that by its very nature hides its true extent. Hopefully instituting profession-wide reporting mechanisms such as Callisto that I believe the AEA is considering will help us learn and more importantly reduce sexual harassment. As my colleague Iris Bonet puts it, it is easier to debias institutions than it is to debias individuals. And that's really what I've been advocating for in this talk. But we need to acknowledge that the changing the direction of institutions is heavy and exhausting work. And the work of changing institutions to benefit women can often end up being a very substantial lady tax. So how are we going to solve this? I think the first thing is small changes are better than no changes at all and can often engender more changes. You know, something as simple as emailing your colleague who's organizing one of the department's seminars but has too few female speakers does make a difference. Second, we need to acknowledge the value of outside help and the potential use, value of using external consultants rather than relying on the women in our departments to effect change. And third, to just continue this theme, this cannot be the work of women. We need to make the case to the majority of men who believe either that their own decisions are meritocratic or that institutional, institutions to correct discrimination is the work of others. We need to show them that institutional bias can mean that the information that they base their decisions on is in itself warped. In the end, we are in this field because we believe that economics research done well can change the world for better. And along those lines, let me conclude by acknowledging three pieces of work that changed how I think. Lundberg and Start's paper on private discrimination and social interventions, showing that laws preventing discrimination could improve allocative efficiency, were an early influence on my own PhD work. Claudia Golden and Ceci Rouse's work on blinding orchestra trials demonstrated to me the power of debiasing institutions. And finally, Marianne Bertrand, Emil Kamenika, and Jessica Pan's work on gender identity and relative income highlighted for me the close link between gender dynamics and power struggles. I'm a better economist for these papers having been written, and I look forward for the day when our economics research more fully reflects a diverse range of voices and values. And this, in turn, helps shape our departmental and professional practices such that female economists need not have sharp elbows for economics to recognize their value. Thank you very much.